He's been a regular face on WHYY over the years, but that's when he was a political pundit. Now you can call him state treasurer. Chip Flowers is our first person this week. Welcome, Chip. Thank you. So glad to be here. I miss I miss being here, I should say, for the record. <laughs> How long has it been? A while. It has been about two years oh, since. Wow. Uh, so it's been too long, and so I'm hopeful that we can uh, continue to great support of WHYY in this community. And it's been a busy two years for you. Um, I know that I've heard people have told you you would never win a statewide election. Is that true? And if so, what do you now? What do they say? I, you know, it's amazing how many people uh, when I first started, you know, we had a great number of supporters, but there was so many people said, listen, you're a great guy. I love that political commentary you do, but you'll never make it. But I always tell people now I don't you know, I don't come back and try to you know, say, look at me now or any that mm -hmm. type of language. What I tell people is like we should be encouraging our children in, our, in their dreams. And I tell people now, when you, you see a young person trying to do something, inspiring to do something, don't be a naysayer say no you can't do that tell them no what can I do to help you and so I really like to when I talk to schools when I talk to parents and teachers that's the message I like to say Let, let's stop trying to cripple people's uh, you know dreams and, and let's talk about what we can do to make them make them succeed um, as part of the Delaware Pardons Board, I want to talk about the thought process that went into what I'm sure was an extremely tough decision to commute the death sentence of Robert Gaddis. Describe that whole process for me. You know, it's a difficult process whenever you are, are, are weighing a life of an individual. Um, you have a moral issue, you have to figure out the facts um, surrounding the decision, um, justify what the jury uh, concluded. But I think ultimately, I know for me personally, what I felt was the fact that, that we have such a great disparity in our sentencing here in Delaware. Um, when you serve on the Board of Pardons, you see a variety of cases. In some cases that are very similar to what happened to Mr. Gaddis, those cases where people were getting 20 years or 25 years or, or even 15 years and walking out of prison. And then you have the Gaddis case, which was by far an awful case, don't get me wrong, but yet he had death. And so I think, you know, we have to just really look at what our sentencing requirements are. We need to figure out if Delaware even wants to continue to do the death penalty. But more importantly, we have to make sure that when we do something, we're consistent with it. You mm -hmm. can't say, let's put this one to death and keep and let the, this one have 20 years. So I think that's really played a lot in my judgment. It had nothing to do with his background, anything like that. It really came down to let's make sure we're doing the right thing and make sure it's fair and it's consistent across the board. And that, but what kind of message does this send about all death penalty cases? I mean, past and future. I think, you know, going forward, I think that there will be some more consistency in sentencing. I think that judges are going to look at our decision and say, what factors did the Board of Pardons and the governor give to why we commuted this sentence to a, a life, um, life without parole? And I think that they're going to basically go back and say, okay, what is going to be those parameters? Let's either do it legislatively or let's make sure from the bench that we make sure that we have some consistent message that can be enforced across the board. You know, we ran a poll on our website and it was overwhelming the results, how one sided they were among um, our viewers and our web visitors saying that they felt all death penalty cases should be reviewed. You know, there is an argument for that. I mean, I think that, listen, there's a practical speak, practically speaking, I mean, the, the amount of paperwork we have for this one case is probably about th uh, this high. So um, clearly took some time to review the files. But I think that there needs to be a review on when are, do we see any patterns? Is it, um, is it racial oriented? Is it, um, is it tend to be only on domestic cases? Or is it tend to be when more than one person is involved? So I think there is some merit to making sure that we are doing the right thing here in Delaware. And I think that doing some sort of review and making sure, because you, know, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell people, when you, when you put someone to death, you can't say, oops, um, we shouldn't have done that. So you have to make sure that you do it before the action is taken, not after. Mm -hmm. Now this week on our table, you released the second <laughs> report on the Delaware State Treasury. That's a new name, by the way. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It is, a, it is a new name. I was uh, one of the first things that we did in coming into office was we decided to go with a name that talked about the Treasury. It was more about people focus. Uh, it used to be go by the name the Office of the State Treasurer, but that's about me. I'm, it's mm -hmm. not about me. It's about the people. It's about their money, their Treasury. So we were glad to change that name. You, you kind of talk about, and I want to get into this in a minute, but the challenges and the initiatives yes. um, that lie ahead for this next year. But a theme I noticed in reading the report was transparency. 
Yes, you know, it's very important. Whenever you're dealing with $2 billion of taxpayer money, that people know what's going on. And I think what has happened historically, and this is not just like my predecessors or anything, but there was a sense of let's go in the back room and, and cut a deal and let's let a few banks have the money. And, and, and that's not what I'm about. And I make no bones about it that I don't care if you reelect me or not. Mm -hmm. I just say that we're going to stand for the what's right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what anything, and my father used to say, the way you come into office is the way you leave. So you should come in with intent integrity and that way you can leave with integrity and so we have to be transparent I want people to know what we're doing it's not my money um, the people have elected me and I'm blessed for that opportunity to serve in this position but we are going to do it the right way we're gonna give people in Delawareans an opportunity those who qualify to manage state money and as long as we're making a, a decent rate of return and that we're doing the right thing it's, it, it, we should be able to spread this money throughout the state, and that way people have a chance to obviously um, grow and support our financial institutions. Uh, biggest challenge lying ahead for us? I think the biggest challenge is the fact that we're going to have to restructure our state portfolio. Um, this portfolio, some of the policies in effect were before I was even born. Hmm. And, and, and that's a long time ago, <laughs> just, just for the record. Um, and so I think part of the problem is that the, the, the policies you have from the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s aren't equipped to deal with the challenges of today's global economy. Um, even the cash management board that helps the treasury manage money, they only meet twice a year. Could you have managed, um, imagine meeting only twice a year to manage $2 billion? So we need some serious upgrading and looking at the way that we're going to adopt policies related to our state portfolio, but we're going to work and we're going to change it and we're going to do the right thing. Okay, and, and an, an initiative that you want to highlight? Well, you know, I think with, with two initiatives, one is that we're going to be doing prepaid debit cards, which I think is long overdue. When we have someone getting a, a reoccurring state payment every month, whether it's payroll or a vendor, why keep issuing that person a check every month? We can give the person a credit card, a debit card, and say, look, every month we're going to fill it by that amount, and that saves so much money for the state. Mm -hmm. Another initiative that we're going to be looking at is maybe issuing warrants for those projects that are funded um, by the state through the strategic fund and say, listen, you know, if we're going to give money to companies, and that's the governor and the administration's decision, which company to give, we're not going to get involved in that. But at least we should be able to do on the upside if that company grows, goes public, and, and, and really becomes successful, that we should be able to cash out like other states and make a significant profit off of it. Um, let's talk about Fisker. Uh, they had an announcement that they're going to be making some layoffs. Yes. It's kind of the latest in a series of bad news for this new hybrid automaker. Yes. Um, how worried should the state be? And is, or is the state already worried? You know, it's a great question. Look, I mean, Fisker was, is going to have its challenges because obviously the, the market is competitive, as we all know, it's auto market. I think that it goes to highlights why it's important to have the Treasury involved in those type of decisions because, for example, if Fisker decides not to come to Delaware, but yet we've given them money, if we have warrants, warrants would make sure that no matter what happens to Fisker in Delaware, if they grow anywhere else, we can always exercise mm. those warrants and we get the cash back. So it, it kind of hedges our bet here and says, well, listen, we're not going to just have loan guarantees that they may not be able to make. We're going to say, listen, well, if this plan happens to fail, we can recoup our investment mm -hmm. and actually make some more money if they go public. So there is some concern, but I think the governor and his team, they're going to be able to work something out. But I think Fisker will have some challenges. I think it's a competitive market, as we saw with Detroit, uh, with the recent Super Bowl commercials. I mean, there is that feeling that Detroit's coming back. And so for a new entrant into that market, it's going to be quite competitive, but we're hoping the best for them. Now, have you had a chance to look at the Boxwood Road plant? Or or has the governor, do you know? I mean, well, the governor and his team, they've been out there uh, on numerous occasions. They're working hard as well with our congressional delegation, and I'm hoping to visit the, the, the facility, facility soon. Um, but I think that the, the key thing is that we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. And I think, um, you know, Delaware used to be the three C's, uh, chemicals, cars, and chickens. And I think we need a whole bunch of C's plus some A, B, C, <laughs> D, F, D, G, the whole, the whole no, nine, alphabet. the whole alphabet. So, and I think what it shows us is that when we use state money to support projects, that we're going to have to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to compete, that we are not being influencing the market in any way, that we're allowing the private sector to determine which projects are going to succeed and let us give money on a fair and competitive basis. Um, on MLK Day this year, you were in Lewis, um, and you gave this speech, and it detailed five steps towards equality. And you kind of mentioned something about how Dr. King's dream, the translation, might have been lost along the way. What did you mean by that? <laughs> you know, everyone's been talking about the speech. I, I, I'm glad. I, it was actually, inspirational. I, well, thank you very much. But I, I think that what happens is, I always say, let's not turn Dr. Dream's dream into a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that, you know, that we had a mentality for a while where it was keeping up with the Joneses. Um, I want a bigger house. I want a bigger house. I want four cars. I want, that wasn't the dream. 
Dr. King's dream was, listen, that you, for a hard day's work, you get fair pay, and you get an opportunity to live out your success story. So I tell people all the time that that's what the dream was about, equality and making sure that we have a decent living. Dr. Dream didn't say he wanted you to be rich. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not what our founding father said. We didn't say everyone was going to be rich. We said, listen, America's a chance for opportunity where you can live out your dreams and you have a chance to succeed in a variety of different ways, but it's not necessarily monetary wealth. Mm -hmm. But the dream is not to be poor. The dream is not to be poor either. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. But it means to be fair and to be having an opportunity to achieve your dreams. And I think what has happened is that some people have interpreted that, well, Dr. King said I can have a beach home, a, a regular house, <laughs> a Ferrari, a Lamborghini. No, that, that's not that's not what was I, that's not what at least I got out of the, the, his message. His message was, listen, and discrimination needs to end and that we all need to have a shot to succeed because if we lift everybody up, imagine the potential of America. And I think that dream was in line with our founders and I think that's what resonated so well uh, when Dr. Dream was when Dr. King was alive. And so I think that that's what we have to remember, the essence of the dream and that's really the essence of the United States and the essence of Delaware. Many thanks to State Treasurer Chip Flowers for joining us on First this week.